Uh, Hiroaki Matsutani is a professor at the Department of Inno Information and Computer Science, KU University, Yokohama, Japan. He received a PhD degree in engineering from KU University in 2008. He's currently serving as associate editor of IEEE Transaction on Computer and IEEE Design and Test. His research topic broadly cover computing infrastructure of various types and scales ranging from edge to cloud. Specifically, is working on tiny ML algorithms and their FPGA acceleration and the chip integration. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, have a, hello everybody. Um, this talk is about uh, on-device learning of neural networks for wireless sensor nodes. Our applications are anomaly detection, which can be specialized for a given environment by training at a deployed environment. I will start with the motivation of the on-device learning on resource-limited edge devices. Internet of Things or IoT devices are used in various places, such as factory building, UAVs, personal mobility, home electronics, surveillance, healthcare, and weather forecasting. And we are working on anomaly detection in these real environments. Let me show you one example. Um, this is our demo that monitors air conditioning systems like fans using wireless sensor nodes that can train and predict that deployed environment. The figure on the left shows a wireless sensor nodes that can train and predict at a deployed environment. Anomaly detection results are sent to a cloud server using wireless. The figure on the right shows a, a server side. It visualizes the anomaly detection results coming from many wireless sensor nodes. And this is a, another demo that uses a wireless sensor nodes that can train and predict at a deployed environment. The figure on the left shows uh, sensor nodes that consist of Raspberry Pi Pico sensors, magnet, and battery and wireless modules. Okay, so um, this is uh, uh, the sensor node, and uh, they can be attached to the target object using a magnet. And the uh, anomaly detection results of the sensor nodes are transmitted to wirelessly. And uh, the server receives the anomaly detection results and visualizes the result as shown in the right-hand side figure. In the previous examples, the training and uh, predictions are done at edge devices and the anomaly detection results are visualized at the cloud side. This is an example of task partitioning between edge side and cloud side. And edge AI systems can be characterized by such task partitioning. As shown in the uh, left figure, edge AI systems can be classified into six levels. This classification is borrowed from this paper. In the bottom level, Training and predictions are both cloud side, which is not HAI. In levels one, two, and three, prediction or a part of prediction tasks are done at edge devices. So this is a prediction only HAI. In levels four, five, and six, training or a part of training tasks are done at the edge side using edge server and or IoT devices. More specifically, level six is the all on device. Actually, our on device learning focuses on this level six, that is uh, training and predictions are both done at IoT devices. Uh, next, let me explain the motivation and the benefits of the on device learning. Actually, in a real environment, the problem is a gap, the gap between the training data and the deployed environment. In the case of anomaly detection, for example, normal patterns may change as time goes by. Let me show you an um, intuitive illustration 
this is a training function obtained by training data. And this is a testing function, which is corresponding to a deployed environment. As you can see, there is a gap between the training function and testing function. The reason for this gap is that the training and the prediction are done at different places and the different timing. You know, in a typical edge AI, training and uh, uh, training data set is uh, collected from uh, somewhere and the training is performed at the servers. Then the train to weight parameters what trained predictors are deployed at the real environments. And this makes a gap between the training function and testing function, especially in the case of edge AI. And one solution for this gap is using deep neural networks with high generalization capability that can absorb the difference. On the other hand, we are considering how to overcome this problem with a low hardware overhead at the resource limited edge devices, such as uh, controllers and uh, sensors. In short, our approach is very simple. We do not go to deep learning, but we use very small neural networks in order to reduce the computation cost. In this case, uh, training is performed at the edge devices in order to adjust, adjust to uh, deployed environment and follow the changes over time. That is, uh, we do not use uh, bus tab uh, with a high generation capability that can absorb the difference. Instead, our approach uses a small coffee cup like this one, small coffee cup with small capacity, small computation cost. However, uh, this uh, coffee cup has legs, you know, it has a legs, so it can walk. It can adjust to, or adapt to a given environment by walking in order to absorb the difference between the training function and testing function. In this case, uh, uh, training and prediction are done at edge devices. So we call it on-device learning. The on-device learning devices have two modes. That is a train mode and a predictor only mode. In the case of anomaly detection, for example, normal data are learned at the train mode. Then the mode is changed to the predictor only mode so that it can be used for anomaly detection. Okay, so the next question is, how and when is the mode changed? Actually, there are two approaches to switch to from uh, train mode to the uh, prediction only mode. That is a uh, field tunable approach and uh, field adaptive approach. In the field tunable approach, field engineers train HAI whenever they want by using train button. That is retraining is triggered by train button. And in the field adaptive approach, a concept drift detection algorithm is used. That is retraining is triggered, automatically triggered by the concept drift detection algorithm. This is a concept of our own device learning. And uh, our targets are sensors, controllers, and low end uh, CPUs. Actually, it is running on these IoT devices. And uh, let me show you an example. Um, this is a, a wireless sensor node that consists of uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, Pico sensors, magnet, and uh, battery, and LoRa module. As sensors, accelerometers, and the uh, uh, thermal camera are implemented. Let me show you a demo. Yes. There are six wireless sensor nodes and they are started. As initial training, uh, 40 samples are learned as normal. One sample per one second. So the initial training takes about 40 seconds. And uh, when, I, when I make a fire, <laughs> then the anomaly scores of purple node and the anomaly score of blue node increase. And uh, 
when I touch the third device, the anomaly score of yellow node increases. And uh, when I touch a second device, the anomaly score of orange device increases. And also when I put my hand over the thermal sensors, then anomaly score of the purple node and anomaly score of blue node increase. And these anomaly detection result on these wireless sensor nodes are transmitted to wireless gateway using LoRa, which is a wireless. So the, uh, the communication distance of LoRa is actually long range. So it can cover more than one kilometer. So it can deploy in a large place like factories. Let me show you more demos. So please look at the upper right video. The on-device learning is used for detecting abnormal heat of server racks. Let me show you a demo. Oh. Yes. So it is used for detecting abnormal heat of the machines. It uses a thermal camera. This is a thermal camera. And uh, um, this is an abnormal heat source in this demo. And uh, it learns a normal heat patterns first. Then it can detect abnormal heat of machines in a server racks. Okay, so please look at the uh, um, lower left video here. The on-device learning is used for detecting abnormal vibrations of UAVs. Let me show you the more. Yes. So it is used for detecting abnormal vibration patterns. So it is, uses a, a vibration sensors. It learns a normal vibration patterns of propeller first. Then it can use it for detecting abnormal vibrations of propeller of UAVs. And uh, please look at the uh, uh, lower light video here. Um, it, the on-device learning is combined with uh, CNN or YOLO for object detection. The trajectory, trajectory of uh, working people are extracted by YOLO or CNN. Yes. So uh, the trajectory uh, extracted by YOLO and then the trajectories, trajectories of people are uh, inputted to the on-device learning to detect abnormal trajectories. It learns the normal trajectories of walking people first, then it can use for abnormal behavior detection of walking people by detecting abnormal trajectories. Okay, so let me move to the algorithm part. The algorithm is an ensemble of autoencoder neural networks for anomaly detection. Each autoencoder instance can be trained to be specialized to each pattern. For example, please assume uh, rotating machines like fans. The fan is uh, rotating at uh, four different speeds, such as uh, uh, 2,500 RPM, 2,000 RPM, 1,500 RPM, zero RPM. And we want to detect uh, anomaly vibration patterns, but there are four different uh, rotating speeds. So in this case, uh, each autoencoder is uh, trained to be specialized for each pattern or each speed. In this case, we need uh, four autoencoder neural networks. And uh, I will show four class anomaly detection result on cooling fan data set later in this talk. In the prediction only model, it is just like a prediction of multi-layer perceptron. Each autoencoder has three layers. That is input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. And weight parameters between input layer and hidden layer is called alpha. This is a weight parameter alpha. And the weight parameters between hidden layer and output layer is called beta. So this is a weight parameter beta. Um, because this is an autoencoder, so the number of input layer nodes N and the number of output layer nodes M are the same. That is N equals M. 
in order to form an autoencoder. And there are multiple autoencoder instances. In this figure, there are k autoencoder instances. When an input data x is coming, the input data x is uh, inputted to all the k autoencoder instances, and each autoencoder instance outputs loss value. And the instance that outputs the smallest loss value is considered as the closest instance to the input data x. As a result, the smallest loss value and the instance ID are outputs in the prediction process. The central figure shows a prediction that outputs the instance ID that produces the smallest loss value, which is the closest instance. For the sequential training, the closest instance learns the incoming data, X. And we use OSELM, Online Sequential Extreme Learning Machine Algorithm, for the sequential training of each autoencoder neural network. And here on the right shows a sequential training algorithm of OSELM. As I said, the weight parameter between input layer and hidden layer is alpha. Weight parameters between hidden layer and output layer is beta. And OSELM sequentially updates beta based on the input data X sequentially. And please note that the most compute intensive part of OSELM training is a pseudo inverse, pseudo inverse operation, the blue part in the right hand side figure. And if we fix the batch size, to one, that this pseudo inverse operation can be replaced with a reciprocal operation. The pseudo inverse operation, you know, typically requires SVD or QR decomposition. So eliminating the pseudo inverse can significantly simplify the hardware, hardware cost. Actually, only addition, multiplication, and the scalar division needed for our on-device learning. So it is easy to implement on resource-limited hardware. It is easy to be implemented as a dedicated circuits like ASIC. Let me show you the execution time on the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is a $4 microcontroller board. The CPU is ARM Cortex M0 Plus running at 133 megahertz. More specifically, the light Figure shows the uh, implementation of a wireless sensor node. This is a Raspberry Pi Pico. This is a LoRa, and this is an accelerator. The upper left figure, upper left, upper left graph shows execution time breakdown on the CPU. And the blue part is a sensing time using accelerator, and the green part is an FFT, FFT processing. Actually, the Acquired acceleration data is transformed into frequency spectrum. This frequency spectrum is an input data, and it is inputted to, to, to the four three-layer neural networks. The number of input nodes, hidden layer nodes, and output layer nodes are 256, 32, and 256. And the yellow part is a prediction time using four autoencoder instances. And the orange part is a sequential training time using a single instance. Please note that the prediction done by all the four instances, but the sequential training is done by a single instance, which is the closest instance. And the red part is a communication time that transmits the anomaly score to the server using wireless. And the white part is idle time. Raspberry Pi Pico can be sleep mode during this uh, idle time. And please note that uh, everything can be executed within one second. That is uh, sensing FFT, anomaly detection, training, and communication can be executed every second. A benefit of on-device learning is a communication size reduction. If the edge device is in charge of sensing only, the low acceleration data will be transmitted to, to the server using wireless. It is corresponding to the yellow bar, and the communication size is about two kilobytes. If the edge device is in charge of sensing and FFT, 
the frequency spectrum will be transmitted by wireless. And it is corresponding to green bar and the communication size is about uh, one kilobytes. On the other hand, the on device learning transmits only the prediction result. Training at the server is not needed. It is not necessary to send the input data to the server. The, the communication size is only 16 bytes. So low power LoRa is enough. So we can reduce the communication energy consumption. This is very important for battery powered wireless sensor nodes. Okay, so uh, uh, let me discuss the accuracy. A benefit of uh, on-device learning is that it can be retrained when the environment is changed. For example, a neural network was trained at a normal environment like uh, silent office, but it may be deployed in a noisy environment. So in this case, uh, normal pattern is changed in the noisy environment and the detection accuracy will be dropped. That is, uh, there is a big difference between the training function and testing function. As I mentioned before, there are two variants of the cooling fan data sets. One is a normal data set and another one is a noisy data set. Normal data set was collected in a silent office, but the noisy data set was collected near the ventilation fan as a noise source. And uh, uh, each data set has uh, vibration patterns of four different speeds. That is uh, 2,500 RPM, 2,000 RPM, 1,500 RPM, zero RPM. And we want to detect damaged fan or low speed fan in the noisy environment. In the graph, uh, uh, y-axis is ROC, AUC, or uh, prediction accuracy. And x-axis shows uh, seven tasks in the cooling fan data set. And the uh, green bar, green bars is a prediction only AI that was trained at a normal environment, but cannot adapt to a noisy environment. And the blue bar, blue bar is on-device learning. <clears throat> that can be adapted to noisy environment by detraining at the deployed environment. And these anomaly detection tasks are actually very simple and easy to get the high accuracy. However, the problem is the vibration patterns of normal environment and the noisy environment are quite different. That is, there is a big difference between the training function and testing function. That the prediction only AI in a green bars is low accuracy, but uh, on device learning in a blue bars is high accuracy. Please look at the upper right graph. Y axis is anomaly score and X axis is elapsed time. Normal data is inputted first, but later abnormal data is inputted instead. And this is a boundary. So uh, this is the boundary between the normal data and the abnormal data. As shown, anomaly score of on-device learning in a blue line increases sharply at the boundary. So it can detect abnormal data, but uh, um, anomaly score of prediction only AI in green line is not changed. That is, uh, it cannot detect abnormal data. And please look at the, uh, um, lower light graph that shows a similar result. The task is uh, uh, damage one, which is to detect damaged fan at a noisy environment. And uh, uh, y, y axis is uh, uh, anomaly score and X axis is elapsed time. And uh, normal data is inputted first, but later abnormal data is inputted instead. And this is a boundary. And as you can see, uh, prediction only AI in green line introduces a lot of misprediction here, here, and here. But uh, on device learning in uh, blue line achieves good accuracy. Thus, the benefit of the on device learning is that uh, it can be adapted to the noisy environment by detraining at the deployed environment. And okay, so this is a, a summary of this talk. In the case of on-device learning, 
uh, sensing, prediction, and training are done at the edge side. And our concept was implemented in a wireless sensor node that consists of Raspberry Pi Pico and LoRa, LoRa module as a wireless module. In this case, uh, sensing, FFT, anomaly detection, training, and communication can be executed every one second. The communication size can be significantly reduced because only the prediction results are transmitted to the server using wireless. So low power LoRa is enough. We can reduce uh, communication energy consumption. This is very important for battery powered wireless uh, sensor nodes. And regarding accuracy, the accuracy tends to be high in the on-device learning, even if the training function and testing function are quite different because uh, on-device learning can be trained at a deployed environment. Okay, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you a lot, uh, Professor Mazzutani. There are in the Q&A chat uh, uh, eight questions. Uh, people are interested uh, to hear from you about them. So let's try in the next five minutes to address some of them. For the others, we cannot. Uh, please uh, kindly use your time uh, to, to provide, to type answers uh, later on. So let's start from the first. Uh, uh, what metrics are you analyzing to determine a concept drift, mm. the feature map, uh, the inputs? Okay, so uh, we are using mean and variance, <laughs> mean and variance of uh, all the instances. You know, uh, this is an ensemble of multiple autoencoder. So we analyze the mean and variance of each auto encoder instances in order to uh, detect the concept of drift. Actually, uh, this is running on a Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, the memory size is very small. So we uh, developed a sequential algorithm for detecting, detecting the concept of drift detection. Yeah, thank you. And another quite, uh, maybe quick question is uh, about the batch size equal to one uh, during the train phase uh, and uh, if you can increase it. Ah, yes. Um, we are using uh, batch size one in order to eliminate pseudo inverse operation because the pseudo inverse operation typically requires SBD or QR decomposition. So it is very complicated. And it requires a mathematical library. So we fixed batch size one in order to eliminate the external dependency to the mathematical library. And if, of course, we can increase. We can increase the batch size. But in this case, we need to implement a pseudo inverse operation, and it takes a cost, especially if I implement it in dedicated circuits or FPGA. I understand. Uh, next, uh, uh, it's about uh, sensors. Uh, Maybe, maybe the sensor may not be calibrated. So how uh, do you know that the anomaly detection uh, is correctly working uh, if uh, that happens? So the sensor are not calibrated? Uh, how... So the question is, how do uh, you know that the anomaly detection is correctly working uh, on all edge uh, devices if uh, some of these sensor may not be calibrated? Hmm. Thank you. Um, we are monitoring each edge device using a cloud side application. So, and the health monitor is implemented in the cloud side that monitors each edge device so that we can see each device can work correctly. Thank you. Uh, how do you differentiate between concept drift and slowly, <laughs> and slowly appearing anomaly? <laughs> Uh, this is very difficult. Uh, in our case, uh, it highly depends on the application, but uh, we use initial training and uh, stop the retraining. Then we can detect uh, some slowly changing the anomaly. For example, uh, if we start uh, the uh, sensor, then initial training is performed. Then the initial training or retraining is stopped in order to detect a slowing change, slowing anomaly. Thank you. There is a, a, a quite a, a complex question from an anonymous attendee. 
a proper on-device learning framework has three components. Uh, when to learn, mm. detecting feature, uh, shift the distribution, what to learn, deciding the most important sample to use during training to maximize learning effect, mm. and how to learn the learning algorithm. Mm. In your case, are you using sequential training for three? What about one and two? And how do you detect when training need to be done and which sample to be used? Uh, it, it's highly depending on the application. Uh, Actually, there are two retraining strategies. One is a manual one, and another one is an automatic one. The manual one, in the case of manual one, uh, field engineer push, push the train button explicitly in order to retrain. And another approach is uh, uh, automatic retraining using a concept drift detection. I think it's depending on the application. OK. Uh, another question is, uh, um, I don't know if you already answered how to measure the concept drift. Uh, you mentioned <laughs> the variance and the average. Yeah, yeah. OK, mm. thanks. And uh, uh, what happens if uh, uh, data include an anomal uh, data sample? Do you assume uh, all uh, data, all ODL data are uh, normal? So uh, in the case of manual retraining, in this, in this case, the field engineer pushes the train button. And we assume all the input data is normal while pushing the uh, train button. This is assumption. Okay. Mm. This is uh, the assumption. OK, mm. thanks. Um, how does the algorithm get labels? Is it fully supervised? Uh, uh, sorry, is it fully unsupervised? Um, I think it, it, it is a, a semi-supervised approach because field engineers explicitly push the train button while input data is coming. So uh, the label, labeling is very easy, just pushing the train button. So it requires user feedback. Uh, you yeah, mean. yeah, yeah. OK. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Matsutani. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for your interesting presentation, which was uh, much uh, appreciated. Thanks uh, the strategic partners uh, once again, because without them, uh, this uh, type of forum and other many other initiatives would be impossible to organize. And uh, uh, the strategic partners are ARM, very quickly, uh, Edge Impulse, um, Qualcomm, uh, then we have the Platinum uh, uh, Strategic Partner, Diplight, Clicatech, Reality AI, Renesas, Sony Semiconductor, uh, the Gold Strategic Partner, Analog Devices, PhotoHub, Microsoft, NXP, Seed Studio, uh, Sensimil, ST Micro. Synaptics, uh, Science Sense, uh, and then a uh, bunch of uh, strateg silver strategic partners, which are listed here. Uh, thanks a lot. It was really a great uh, afternoon for me and uh, whatever is your time zone. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, no words to express gratitude to the professors and all to attendees for being patient uh, for the extra time. Thank you and see you tomorrow. Have a nice day or evening. Bye.